I'm a little cool this morning, but it sure is comfortable. Uh, Friday, here your next presentation, $300 heads up display to get ready to start. I just wanted to say thanks for coming. Have a good time. Thank you, thank you for having us. Hello, everyone. Good morning. 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 Looks like we have some repeat business from the last presentation. So uh, first I want to start off with some special thanks. Uh, of course to my family. Uh, no aviation effort can ever get completed without the family and all the help. And especially uh, for my family letting me disappear into the Midwest for two weeks or maybe more. We still haven't made it back home yet. Uh, and also for having all the electronics everywhere across the dining room, uh, dining room table. Um, and at one point having an airplane tail into our uh, Foyer that you had to come beneath. Um, to Chris Young and uh, Dan Murray of the Stratix community. Um, without Stratix, I don't think that I would have been able to figure out everything I need to to get this project off the ground and going. And to uh, Mr. Charlie Becker from EAA for uh, inviting me to come here and uh, show everyone what I've been up to for the last few months. Is Charlie here? So, quick introduction. Uh, I'm from Seattle. I see a lot of other faces from Seattle. Uh, and when I say I'm from Seattle, I mean I'm within the city uh, limits of Seattle. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I can see, I can almost see the stadium from my house. Um, I have uh, two daughters who love to, love to go flying, and uh, my wife was just put up with so much aviation. And uh, the, she gets horribly horribly, horribly airsick, so I can't even take her along with me, so um, the definition of a saint. Uh, a little bit about my aviation background. So as a little kid, I grew up near Washington, D.C. I almost lived at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, went to uh, the Fall Garber facility, which was the restoration facility as a little kid, lived just a couple miles from Frederick Municipal Airport and Gaithersburg Municipal Airport. Um, just playing crazy as a kid. I started flying when I was in college. Um, Cessna 150 wet with an instructor was about $50 an hour back then. Um, flying's actually only gotten cheaper for me because uh, of oh, airplane ownership, which is kind of weird. Uh, I finally finished my ticket in 2005. I bought a Cessna 150, which I owned for a long time. And then I built a Zenith 701, which is the platform that I've installed this heads up display in. Um, also a uh, very active member of a uh, flight community in the north that started in the northwest called Flights Above. I think we're up to about 11,000 members regionally uh, across the country now and about 9,000 regionally. And this is my third time at AirVenture flying in the 701. And this is my bird. Uh, you might have seen it either here or on YouTube. Uh, so a little bit of, uh, about my background here and why I was uh, decided to take on this project. I'm a software engineer, a former game developer. I worked on an original, a launch title for the original Xbox. I shipped games on the original PlayStation, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360. I was mostly doing uh, artificial intelligence work for the enemy combat players uh, and a lot of network code. Obviously, uh, computer science background, and I've, I've worked at uh, Microsoft for Bing for a good time too. Uh, a little heads up here or about the heads up display. Uh, I found over the last six months that it's really, really, really hard to take a picture of a heads up display because of the way the optics and the combiner work. So uh, when you see the images, just keep in mind that what you actually see with your eyes is actually takes up a little more field of view than it appears in the pictures. And they're also really, really, really hard to, to focus on. And um, I know this is going to be a big question on everyone's mind, a little sneak peek of what it looks like. Uh, it survived the, the great Ripon and Green Lake approach of 2018. Uh, it survived it very well, so it kept it around 30 frames per second or so. And um, I knew when traffic was trying to sneak in onto, uh, onto the railroad tracks without going over the tower. So. <laughs> And uh, here's a little A-B comparison of, uh, I took a screenshot of four flight um, at about the same time as I took a screenshot of, of the heads-up display I was coming onto Green Lake and Ripon. 
And you can see right here that the amount of information that you're being saturated with on ForeFlight is just overload unusable versus right here, and we'll get into what this iconography actually means, this is actually um, a, a lot quicker and easier to digest and much more unobtrusive. Uh, let's see if we can get the video to work. So the point of this video here is this is uh, near my home airport of Arlington, Washington. And uh, there are two points here, uh, just to show it in flight. And then uh, my hand was a little bouncy with the camera as so it was recording the video. So what you'll see is that the image of the heads-up display is kind of moving back and forth, uh, almost independent of the optical combiner, which shows you and demonstrates that the image is actually ahead of you, uh, somewhere near the propeller and not on the windshield. So your eyes aren't refocusing as you fly along. So um, a lot of people have asked to see it. My plane is about uh, 200 yards to our left here over on Road 300, home built camping. And I'm actually going to fire off the software on the graphics processor here at the end of the presentation. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some GPS and ABS interception inside the hangar. So now the question is, you've seen what it looks like. How did I start down this road of creating a heads-up display for a 600-pound airplane? Um, and it kind of started off with a joke. So we have a flower bombing, uh, a flower bombing contest every year at my home airport in Arlington. It's part of the uh, Sunday Fun Day is what we call it. And uh, I did really, really poorly uh, in 2017. Just absolutely whiffed it. So uh, a bunch of us uh, started joking about what would it take to build a targeting computer <laughs> for, for a flower bomb? Um, and we'll get back to that. But, <laughs> but that's, that was kind of the joke. So we talked about, you know, maybe instrumenting the flower bombs to record how long it took and all sorts of, you know, gee whiz tech stuff. Um, and then uh, about Four or five months later, it starts getting cold in Seattle. I read an EAA uh, experimental article on a, uh, a cell phone triggered engine preheater. I go and take a look at the source code, and I decided that there's a lot of things that I wanted to change about it. Um, so I ended up almost completely rewriting the source code. Um, but what it did was it started pulling me into this world of single board computer experimentation. And so this one, besides having the, uh, the, the cell phone modem, that sticks out in my hangar with a whole antenna. Um, I ended up adding a gas sensor so I'd know if my uh, gas sampler sprung a leak. Um, I put a temperature sensor on it so I'd know if it was even cold enough to require engine preheating or how long I wanted to preheat my engine for. Um, I put a light sensor on so I would know if I left the lights on in the hangar. Uh, and then uh, a little after that, so I started getting sucked, in, uh, getting sucked into this world of Raspberry Pi. Um, I end up building one of these. Um, a gentleman by the name of Dylan Rush uh, wrote the original source code. I took it, modified it a whole bunch uh, to my liking, so it has sunrise, sunset. Once again, one of these kind of Raspberry Pi projects. So then, um, a little later, I add ADSB out to my airplane. And I go to this VDL82, which uh, it's been a really great easy thing to install. And I figure, well, I have to do some work. I have to pull off my xenon strobes. I have to, to, to reduce my power draw. Uh, I have to do some other electrical work on the plane to make sure I have budget to, to drive the transponder. And there are a whole bunch of quality in there, which brought me around to rebuilding my ADSB receiver. So I built a Stratux uh, open source ADSB receiver in September 2015. And I said, well, it's only another $150, $200 to build a new ADSB receiver. I might as well get, uh, build one with the new Raspberry Pi board, put the AHARS chip F2, any reference system, so orientation, the GPS, and all the fixings on it to, uh, to, to get the most out of my new setup, especially since I was going to be painting the towers and getting traffic back. And then I saw an ad on Amazon. And it was for this little piece of prison glass. 
And the idea was that you would lay down your cell phone flat like this, and there's a little piece of prison glass here, and the idea is that it's supposed to reflect whatever the image of your phone is and act like a heads-up display. So then I kind of have a eureka moment. And I decided that I'm going to buy a little LCD panel. I bought it for about $50 from a company called Sunfounder. I bought one of these cheap little felt prompter glasses. And I had the realization that if ForeFlight and all these other pieces of software had access to all the ADSB and Attitude information on my receiver, that I could start pulling all of that for the flower bombing computer. <laughs> um, so, uh, so thinking about a little more, I realized that this is also a really great opportunity to deal with traffic awareness. And uh, my plane has very poor rearward, rearward visibility. It's relatively slow. I cruise about 92 miles an hour. So, the and I'm grass colored. So all those things combined made me really worry about a plane sneaking up behind me without me being able to see it, unless I do like 90 degree crazy Ivan turns every five minutes, which is um, not great for your cruise economy. So I came up with some project goals, and I realized if I didn't have goals, then I would always be shifting the goal line. So the primary idea was to aid traffic awareness, to augment it, not replace it. Um, to allow me to not look at my phone or tablet or whatever else I have on my panel because then that forces my eyes to refocus. And then you have to go from that refocus time looking at your phone back out to the cockpit and it takes a, a second or two for your eyes to start focusing to that point where it can be effective actually finding airplanes. And then I wanted to make it so other people could use it so it wasn't permanently permanently by FAA definition installed on the airplane, so you could put it in a Mooney if you wanted to. Um, actually, one of my friends is rebuilding the Mooney and has been egging me on quite a bit. And um, I also wanted to create a system that you could install on an airplane that had a, a weak alternator like a Rotex, since we only get 18 amps at peak, and you don't want to really draw that full 18 amps all the time. Uh, now, being a software guy, I wanted to worry about uh, fault tolerance, make sure that it was really tested, uh, make it really easy to build because I knew the, the poor soul who was going to be building it. Um, I want to keep it inexpensive because no one, we were already spending a lot of money on our planes. Something that could potentially let you know a plane coming right at you should not be expensive. And then I also wanted to keep all the software free as a way of kind of paying for it. So, uh, a couple things that I wanted to keep out of scope of the project initially uh, were things like an angle of attack indicator. I don't have enough data coming at me right now to accurately do angle of attack. Um, it is possible with a few other projects, the, uh, the level of bomb, uh, the broadcasting out of the I guess is its real name, um, that has true angle of attack. Uh, some friends of mine uh, did a project called the Airball, which won an award from PAA in 2016. Uh, I've been talking to them. These are other possible data sources that we could do. Um, I didn't want to do weather, because to properly display weather is going to take a lot of that real estate on the screen. It's going to be really busy. That's, keeping away, uh, that's getting away from the idea of something really simple that's easy to digest. And I, don't, I didn't want to initially uh, integrate with any specific avionics like the Dynon 180 that's in my plane. Um, I have all, all the ARs data in my plane, but I have to connect an RS-232 core. I have to uh, read that data off, convert it into something usable, pull it in, um, and then you're talking about wiring and soldering, and that gets uh, into a much more complex project. So. My approach to the project here was to make it a software problem and not a hardware problem. So what I've tried to do here is make the heads-up display about creating the image and drawing the image, not about acquiring the data or how to project the data. So in the end, what's happened is that uh, my project here, it, you can hook it up to either an automotive heads-up display that takes an HDMI input, or you could go and buy the really super amazing Epic Optics 
which is a $2,000 uh, heads-up display. And it actually has an HDMI port, but it has no ability to actually create the drawings itself. You have to supply the data and, and the graphics to it somehow. So you can take uh, my system, plug it directly in, and you have really amazing optics. Um, I'm a software guy, not an optics guy, so I didn't want to deal with trying to shape lenses or mirrors and things like that. That's out of my realm of, of expertise. I wanted to try to find something that we could leverage quickly and cheaply to get the project successful. And then also I want to have a focus on traffic first. So while thinking about what this thing should look like and how I should do it, uh, my childhood came up. I grew up on flight simulators. Um, so stuff like the Micro series, uh, the Strike Eagle, uh, Falcon 3.0. I think we've all wanted to fly an X-Wing at some point. Um, and of course, real hugs. This is a screenshot from a Saab jet. Uh, it may have been a vegan. Um, I can't remember where I took the screenshot from. So I wanted to take all those ideas of usability and, and images uh, try to make it as easy as possible. So, coming around to the process of how I created this thing, um, first I rebuilt my Stratix. Um, I realized that I need to have GPS and the attitude system chip inside of it. Uh, that way, all the processing of the relative direction and where all the other aircraft are, all that could be done by my ADSB receiver, and many other ADSB receivers put out the data in the same exact format. So my system ended up being a dual antenna with an ARs and GPS. So then that kind of came around to the overall architecture of how I wanted to build this thing. Uh, here we can see that the traffic is coming from other aircraft, the ground stations, and the GPS feeding into my ADSB receiver. And then my graphics processor is pulling that data from the ADSB receiver and then sending it to the display. So once again, trying to keep that one component isolated as easy as possible. So um, then once I kind of came up with that idea, then I started thinking about what the software was going to look like internally. And I knew that I wanted to run on a Raspberry Pi. That's what the Stratix ADSB receiver runs on. Uh, my ultimate goal is actually to run the software on the receiver itself, eliminating the second, the second uh, computer board. And, um, we, we believe that there's more than enough horsepower on the receiver to do it. Um, I've just kept them separate for, for reasons of experimentation right now. And then I want to choose tools and libraries that would make this as easy as a project and quick as a project for me to create, worrying more about the correctness of the software and the ease of development of the software than the absolute performance of the software. Uh, yes, you can test it on the Linux box, but Windows is in my primary development environment. But obviously, it, uh, it's running Raspbian and, and it's running Linux. So, so some guiding principles they came up with were keeping software simple, keep it quick, keep it unobtrusive, and then keep it display independent. So what makes uh, all of this possible is the, uh, the GDL90 protocol. Um, obviously named after the Garmin ADSB receiver, the GDL90. Um, Stratus, Stratex, um, Level, uh, Dual, they all use the same protocol and the data is all coming back in the same way. So theoretically, if you hooked up my device to, this, to any other uh, ADSB receiver that has ARs or GPS, you should get the same exact graphics. Um, what you do is you subscribe uh, to the ADSB receiver say, hey, I want traffic updates, and then it just starts streaming traffic to you, and then it's up to the software that's consuming, like ForeFlight or, or my system, to do with it as it wants. And then you have to pull the uh, attitude indication on demand. You have to ask for it every 60, every 60th of a second or so. So this is uh, getting even more into the, the technical jargon here, but this is an example of what the attitude information looks like when you pull it from the ADSB receiver. It's just actually just a bunch of text uh, that's in a what we call a key value format. So what the data is followed by the value, 
this is what I get in my software, and then I get a part essentially to get the value, and then continue running my process. So getting a little out of the weeds here. Um, so the UI went through a whole bunch of changes as I was working on it. Um, some, uh, somewhat notoriously, uh, during a big aviation conference that we have in the Seattle region every February, I sat down on the sofa with, with my laptop and a bunch of friends, and I just started working on it during this conference. And um, this is what I came up with after about uh, a day or so of work. Um, and it basically proved out the concept. Uh, this is running on my laptop. And this was just proving out the concept that I could pull the heading, I had a heading strip that had attitude indication, and on the left-hand side, in very small font, you can see that I was pulling traffic, and that I was actually able to successfully pull the traffic information off the ADSB receiver. Now, in the end, this became way too busy, and displaying the traffic with the, uh, with the attitude information is way too busy, um, so we moved away from that. So then, this is uh, the next step here, um, I finally hooked up the, uh, the little five-inch HDMI screen, uh, put it on the little $7, $15 cell phone reflector, and I found a bunch of problems with this setup. You couldn't see through it, your eyes focused at the point of reflection, so it didn't look like it was ahead of you, uh, the top was cropped off, um, a whole bunch of problems there. But it proved that the system worked, so I was a little more emboldened to, to progress. Uh, it was very easy to do. Uh, you, you do need to dremel some stuff out. But uh, daylight visibility was also kind of poor. So then a friend of mine works in uh, uh, works in television uh, as a teleprompter uh, operator. So it's like, hey, go and buy this piece of teleprompter glass and uh, try it out. So I bought the piece of teleprompter glass, designed a 3D printable case, and then I tried this out. Same screen. Um, here we can see that the, the processor board is actually right below, so it's, it's fully encased in this time. Um, and it's, you can see a lot more of the screen. And after uh, playing around with that for a few days, I actually took it on a flight. Uh, so uh, I was able to buy the teleprompter glass from a company called teleprompterglass.com. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, so what they do is they have uh, two different thicknesses of two different reflectivities. So that's four permutations. And you can buy these samples that are actually perfectly sized for $1 each. Uh, plus $15 shipping. <laughs> but, um, uh, but the screen I think cost me somewhere between $40 and $50, um, a dollar for well, we'll amortize that out, like $8 for the glass. Um, and then a friend printed the case for me, $35 for the CPU board. So you're looking at about $100 to put this thing together in this form. Um, here you can also see that I've started really cementing down the, uh, the UI here. And um, I have a slide that explains it a little more. But here you can see that uh, on the bottom you have a heading strip. And GPS track and a compass track. Uh, compass track is on the left, GPS track is on the right. Um, to the right of the screen is 180 degrees to your right. To the left of the screen is 180 degrees to the left. So if you see something like here, that means it's at your 3 o'clock. If you see it over by 180, then that, uh, that means it's at your 9 o'clock. And then we have these, uh, this concept I came up with, these high visibility information cards that show the tail number of the aircraft, uh, its bearing from you, how far away it is, and its relative altitude. So in, here, in this case, November 1546 Foxtrot is bearing 160. It's 1.8 statute miles away from me, and it's 1,900 feet above. So this is still really cheap. Uh, everything looks nice and tidy. Um, but it still suffers from daylight visibilities. I tried making a little hood to, to try to back, uh, try to get a little shade, um, but that just encroached on the visibility and looked goofy. Um, it requires a 3D printer. 
Um, now you have some glass in the cockpit. Uh, and the focus still wasn't ahead of me like I really wanted. But this emboldened me even more. Uh, success can be a little bit of a dangerous thing, I suppose. Uh, so then uh, I got the, uh, the go-ahead to go for my wife to go and buy uh, something called the Hudlin, which is an automotive projector. And I bought this for $210 on Father's Day sale. I think it's normally $235. And I hooked it up to my to my machine, and everything just worked, which was fantastic. And uh, here we have a picture that a friend took at our Arlington flying and air show, um, and you can see that it's very plainly uh, daylight visible. And a lot of people have asked me how daylight visible is it. It is that daylight visible, straight into the setting sun. And let's see here. This was a video, and it. it played when I created it, but I guess it's not going to play now. Uh, so, now this solves another issue here of, about where does it appear. And to, to me and to most people, it appears somewhere around the propeller unit. So it's actually out ahead of me. It's not an infinite focus, because um, we're not, I'm not doing anything weird with optics, fun with optics. Uh, if you want an infinite focus, then the Epic Optics is the, the projector that you want. Um, but it's $2,000, literally in order of magnitude. But it's out ahead of me, and it's easy to look through, and it's far enough ahead that my eyes don't refocus. So uh, at this point, I'm not willing to spend another $2,000. <laughs> now, um, it, it's really compact. Most people, uh, when they see the plane, they have to ask me where the projector is, which is really nice. I don't notice the projector at all. I've been able to position it so it's completely out of my field of view, which is really nice. Yeah, great visibility. Um, it is $200 versus about $60 for the LCD screen and 3D printing. Um, I'm actually incorrect on this uh, 3 amp total. It's actually probably about an amp and a half at 12 volts. So. My ADSB receiver is pulling one amp at five volts. My graphics processor is pulling about one amp at five volts, and then the projector is pulling anywhere between an amp and an amp and a half at five volts. So it's a fairly low power system. And if anyone has questions, feel please uh, ask them as we go along. So here are the here are the components that uh, I'm using right now. Um, here I've, I've tilted the camera a little, so on the left hand side you can see the projector, uh, which is the Hudley Classic, which is a repurposed automotive projector. You can see the little optical combiner piece of glass. In the middle we have my Raspberry Pi, um, it's an uh, off the shelf computer, it has a metal heat sink fan on it just because I want to make sure that it would survive Midwestern summer. And then I'm using a keypad to, uh, to issue some simple commands to the unit. Uh, a future idea, uh, future plans are probably to have like a web page or an app or something you can control it with. Uh, now there are other options. This, uh, 2018 seems to be the, uh, the year of the heads-up display, as I found out. Um, Epic Optics announced their 2.0 display, which has an HDMI input. And uh, if you go to Hangar C, you should really see it. it is an amazing thing to see. Their, their optics engine is absolutely fantastic. Um, my GoFlight actually uh, has their own heads-up display projector, but they modified it to only take 28 volt. Um, but it's the same exact projector as the Hudley that I'm using. And then um, GRT is showing the Kinnick, uh, which is another automotive projector that should work, and it also takes an HDMI input, and it's very similar. Um, Dual announced their own set of uh, ADSB receiver and heads-up display that uses a very similar projection technology, but their ADSB receiver is the only thing that can drive their heads-up display. So if you want their heads-up display, you have to have their ADSB receiver. And so here are some pictures of what the other ones look like. Uh, the center is the Dual, and you can see that's a dash-mounted solution. Uh, it does not have an HDMI input. Uh, the one on the left is the MyGoFlight solution, which uses the same combiner and the same projector. And then the one on the right is the Epic Optics, which is also a dash mounted solution.
So uh, the, the one that Dual is offering, they're offering uh, just for the projector about $500 on show special. I think it was $800 on show special with their ADS-B receiver. Uh, the Hubley projector costs $210 and is a fairly similar display technology. So uh, getting back to something I mentioned earlier about uh, different view modes, and now we're going to really start getting into the meat of what this thing does and what it looks like. Um, I realized very quickly that uh, information overload was easy to, to make happen with my system. So I came up with this idea of view pages and being able to cycle through and select the information that I wanted to see to try to minimize things to make my workload as easy as possible and to help me, not to saturate me. So I came up with this idea of elements that I could reuse across the different views. So all a view or a page is, is just a collection of these easy to reuse elements that you can just re recombine kind of like Taco Bell. Pick the same five ingredients, you come up with a chalupa. Pick the same five ingredients, put it around with something else special, and you get a gordito. The Taco Bell method. And uh, the software is initially built on a, a Windows laptop. It could run on a Mac uh, if you wanted to. And uh, I'm using uh, Visual Studio Code and uh, some debugging equipment, so that way I could write the software on Windows. I have really easy ability to debug the code, test the code, run the code, get it running quick, and, and make sure that everything was working the way I wanted to, but not have to modify it to run on my Raspberry Pi. And then uh, for controllability, I have this little uh, $15 keypad. Uh, for those of us who are in tech world, it's a mechanical switch keypad, which is nice and clicky. Uh, also makes it really nice for a cockpit environment because it's really sturdy. Um, I use the keypad actually to control it. So uh, plus and minus will toggle through your view pages. Um, escape button will uh, tell the ARs to level itself that you're in a level flight, so you can um, so if you move your uh, ADSB receiver around, um, you can tell, okay, this is the new level position. And then for target bombing mode, I had two keys to set a target and to clear targets. <laughs> and we'll get into that a little more. So here's kind of the, uh, the meat of what it looks like. Obviously, this is in a debug mode, um, so you don't see an image behind it. The way the projector works is anything that's black is not drawn and therefore becomes see-through, so it's an additive color process. Now, um, I live in uh, Ballard's uh, in Seattle's neighborhood of Seattle. Uh, we have a lot of seaplane traffic, and uh, I'm lucky enough to hear big radial Brad Whitney engines fly over my house all the time. Um, so over here, on the right-hand side, we have an information card for 708 Kilo Alpha, that's one of the Kenmore uh, Kenmore Airlines birds, and it's bearing 173.8 statute miles away, and uh, just skimming the ground at 300 foot AGL, which is nice for, for my ears. Um, and here we can also see that there's a targeting bug right here that's pointing to the relative bearing. Uh, the little red triangle is pointing to the heading strip location. And the size of that red triangle changes based on how close or far away the aircraft is that I'm interested in. So the closer the airplane, the bigger the red targeting bug, and the higher up the information card becomes. So I'm prioritizing the aircraft information for the planes that are closest to me. Um, here we can see that one plane, uh, the information card is a little, uh, a little dark. And that means that we haven't heard a ADSD response for, uh, from it for about a minute. So I'm starting to fade it out as an indication that that plane has been, we've lost contact with it, we haven't heard a report from it, um, that it is now starting to go away. And this is, uh, this is the view that most people seem to be really interested in. This is the, uh, what I've come up for my attitude indication. Uh, you can see that I have a GPS altitude an instantaneous G loading, uh, a ground speed, I guess I was wiggling the GPS receiver, uh, a pitch, both in the ladder, and I'm actually writing the number of angles off, off pitch that I am. So negative 10 is down 10 degrees, 10 degrees is nose up 10 degrees, and then I have roll as well, along with that 
uh, magnetic encompass track. Now, if you don't want the targeting bugs, I also came up with this view, which just shows me a straight up listing by proximity. So it close explains at the top of what's nearby me. To make things easier, if I call for flight following, because I always forget what, uh, what time it is, universal, we'll apply. I have some basic system information here. Um, I do filter out my own ship information. So uh, if you want to, if you want to not know about your own airplane's position and not see the targeting information for it, you just change a piece of configuration to your tail number, and the system filters it out and doesn't worry about you. Uh, along with the uh, some information about the network connectivity. So if I was having problems trying to keep up with it, I could remote into the system and start seeing what's going on. And then if we lose contact with the ADSB receiver, this is what shows up for anything that uses ADSB information. So you wouldn't see this for the diagnostic system, you wouldn't see this for the clock, um, but if you're in AHAR's traffic mode and we lost the Wi-Fi connection, uh, this is what you'd see to let you know that you had a problem. And then that brings us back around how this whole thing started of the flower bombing computer. Uh, so I went out and uh, did a whole bunch of practice, filmed my flower bombs dropping on the remote grass grip from multiple altitudes, multiple cameras, timed it all. Um, targeting computer, I had a little bug in my software from when we actually did it, so I only got the targeting computer for the first pass. Um, the second pass actually showed my practice point uh, over top of my actual target, but the first pass was 24 feet off from a minimum speed of 60 miles an hour at 200 feet AGL, so uh, winning me first place. <laughs> uh, basically what I did here was I just had a, uh, a bearing, uh, how high you were from the target since we had a minimum AGL, uh, how far away the, the bomb point is, and the bottom is how many seconds until release. So when that hits zero, you drop, and you should theoretically be good to go. So getting back a little more to the, to the function and uh, how this thing works, um, internally the software, what I do is I have uh, two separate tasks. One is pulling the attitude in, uh, information all the time at uh, 60, uh, 60 frames per second. The other is uh, getting fed the traffic information from the ADSB receiver all the time. And then independently, they're pushing that into a common data store that the graphics then pull from. So that way, if the graphics start slowing down, I'm not slowing down my attitude refresh at all. And then from that, the graphics go straight to the projector. Uh, a little bit of detail, this was written in Python. Uh, it's not the fastest language, but it's not the slowest language. Um, I arrived at it because it had the graphic support to be able to run on both Linux, Windows, and Mac. So that way I was making things a little easier on myself. Uh, in the end, it is using the graphics processor on, on the Raspberry Pi to make things a little faster. Um, I use a system called the SDL, which is a common graphics library for Linux. Um, I use something called PyGame, which is a Python game library that sets up all the hard infrastructure of the event loops, the graphics pipeline, and all that stuff. Once again, trying to optimize things for my own ease of coding and my productivity. And then I use some fairly common networking libraries to, to do all the hard work there. Uh, I haven't been able to test it yet on other ADSB receivers, but theoretically, if I join the device to the network that's created by the ADSB receiver, it should work. Uh, I spent a good long time talking to uh, level technologies, and we're fairly confident if we uh, try to use it with the broadcasting outer module, that it would work. Oh, hopefully they'll send me a demo unit. <laughs> um, but uh, for it to work, you do need to have the ARs and the GPS embedded. Um, and anything that takes, any projector that takes an HDMI input, it will work with. Um, the, I was actually planning later today to go over to Epic Optics and see if they would let me try to plug my system into theirs just to make sure and, and for nerd points. 
Uh, so this is how the projector works. It's a little LCD screen. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, what it looks like, where it's coming out of the projector. If you look, the image is actually horizontally flipped. So it comes out backwards, and then you have the piece of, uh, of glass that is the optical combiner that then takes it, provides a reflection point, and then flips it around in the way we see it. I don't have to do any image reversing for this projector. With the LCD and teleprompter glass, I have to flip the image. There are some limitations, as I've talked about. It's not a true light engine, so uh, it appears in front of you, quite a bit in front of you, but it doesn't appear at infinity. Um, the resolution is fairly limited. Uh, the, the native resolution is 800 by 240, I believe. But the image, it's enough pixel to, to be able to work with and show what I need to. And then getting back a little bit to how the optics work, um, anything that I don't draw is therefore then black and becomes see-through. And then I try to pick really high contrast color combinations. Green, like is used in real heads-up displays, since that's fairly visually distinct. Um, for text, because I didn't want green and green and green on black to, to really blend together, I chose a high contrast yellow and black combinations. And then in some cases I used red for other things to make things visually distinct. And at this time, I'm going to do here, here, my battery. I'll power this up here. Give it a few seconds to do it. Uh, so some next steps, I want to create a web page so you can bypass the keypad. Uh, make things configurable, create your own views, recombine things as you want. Uh, I want to create some new views and then start taking a look at integration with um, Dynon, TRT, or other, other systems that are broadcasting or make available their own attitude information. And then, of course, the other big question is, is it really $300? And uh, for me, no, it wasn't because I have a pile of parts that I didn't end up using or went through. Uh, but this configuration, as it's installed in my plane, as I'm currently using, is indeed, this works out to be exactly $300. And uh, before we get to the, to the demo here, this is how you find the instructions and software. And uh, if you have a USB keypad, I, I'm more than happy to copy this presentation onto your USB key if you want. Um, some people asked for that last presentation. Uh, but I've tried to make myself as easy to find as possible. You can also look up my channel number, November 701 Del Victor, on YouTube. Um, and you can find me that way and send a message. You can try to find me on Twitter, November 701 Del Victor, or you can find me on GitHub which is an open source uh, code repository. And that's where all the source code and the instructions and everything live. Can you post the slides on GitHub? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll see if I can post the slides on GitHub. It's going to have to wait until I get back home. But I, I can post the slides on GitHub. Uh, there is a full instruction manual, uh, an explanation that I've created, a, a full readme with images in line that show everything else. Um, so if you're wondering how it works and what it looks like, that is on GitHub currently, but not the slide deck. Okay, so hopefully everything's had a good time to warm up. Hopefully we'll get some GPS reception here, and if not, we can move it. And I will do the most dangerous thing in all the software, and that's all I can uh,
stress testing area right here. Uh, it's also drawing at a much higher resolution than uh, we normally would be. So you can see from, from the crispness of the letters that we're probably displaying at 1080p here, which is going to tax the uh, graphics processor a lot more. And I'll show some of the things here. The blue triangle means that the aircraft is on the ground. The red triangle means that it's in flight. And then we're drawing the airplanes that are closest to us on top with the airplanes that are furthest behind on bottom. So we can see all these different targeting parts that are behind us. But I don't necessarily care about those because they're further away than in line. The red diamond right there means that if you were to look through the heads up display, that is where the airplane would be. So that's about where the airplane is when you look through the, through the heads up display. So if we were pointing actually at the four, four, we would see the airplane somewhere in close in that orbit. And that's just letting you know that hey, the target is within a plus six, minus six field, degree left and right. And then the height of the target critical actually indicates how far above or below it is. Perfect day for departure. Now, I, I do want to say that um, you do not only receive traffic that is ADS-B out. In this case right here, we can see, uh, oh, uh, you can see that there was another airplane there um, that did not have a tail number. And what that meant was that we were actually receiving it from the TISB of a ground station. So uh, we, we flew with a friend in a kit box. We did not have ADS-B out. He only had a mode C transponder. And I would actually see him as a target point when we were near a ground station. Um, but generally, I consider this only to be aircraft that are ADS-B out. If you see one that's not ADS-B out, that's in mode C with a ground station, that's just bonus for me. So. Obviously, we're under bolting here a little because uh, I, I use this battery to plug my phone in all night. So we'll get to the AHARS mode, and I'll go ahead and level it out. So here we go. This is the AHARS mode. And the way it works is that it tracks, oh, that is some sort of network connectivity problem here. Okay. So here, as we turn around, it moves. You can see that it moves up and down. And it's a little struggling right now because we have a much higher resolution screen attached, not the projector. Here we go with the traffic uh, listening screen. Hi. This way, if anyone ever asks you if you have time to do something, you have time. <laughs> and then some basic network diagnostics and uh, device diagnostics. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, uh, if it starts to get too warm, it actually will slow itself down. So the CPU doesn't work as hard, so it's not as hot. So I have a little temperature sensor, and as the temperature gets warmer and warmer, they turn some green towards red. And then, in case you just want to turn everything off and just see through things and not worry about it, there's this blank screen. So if, if you're too busy, you're overloaded, you don't care or worry about it right now, you can just disable any drawing whatsoever. And then you get back to to this. You can cycle, you can cycle through. Uh, the flyer bombing module is disabled right now. <laughs> I, I didn't think I was going to be flyer bombing anything between here in Seattle. Okay. And yes? You have an option to, to get rid of the cards but keep the, uh, the diamond? Uh, not currently. I've thought about that. Um, that's obviously, it, it would be very easy to do. And I think that's probably a, a really good next option for when I make the, uh, the, the web page control so you can control from your phone. I mean, you can imagine lots of options. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there, there are lots of options. And then part of the idea is that if I create a web page that you can control it with, then you could create your own page that has with the information cards and the reticles or just the, or just the reticles maybe because they're all just elements that you can turn on and off. Yes, in the blue shirt. Is there a function or a feature in Edge Omniscient that shows the aircraft 
working on you or diverting you from you? Like if it's on the web, you don't care? So, so the question is, uh, is there a feature that shows if an airplane is converging with you? Um, currently, that feature is your brain. <laughs> um, I haven't done the map. It, it's fairly simple, uh, fairly simple 3D map. It's called a dot product. Um, and if you take two directions and then you multiply them in such a way, you can tell if it's pointing towards you or not. Um, I haven't gotten to that point, and that is actually very high on my list. Uh, for filtering out traffic, because obviously if the plane is behind me and heading away, I don't necessarily care about it. Yes, and then... Uh, the question is, how close have I found the right pole to be each of reality? And it's fairly close. Um, I need to narrow up the field of view just a little bit, um, but it's been very close where I've actually been able to see planes through the targeting reticle that were out ahead of me by about a half a mile and uh, 150 feet or so below. Uh, it, it still needs some tweaking, and uh, every installation is probably going to be a little different. So uh, it's, in the software right now, it's actually uh, a hidden adjustment that I can make in the configuration to narrow or spread out that field of view. Um, so that's actually something that would be very easy to, to accomplish with the work. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so the question is essentially, how did I mount the projector to my cockpit, and if there's an angle of range? Um, it's actually uh, uses a, uh, a double-sided piece of tape, uh, tape that comes with the projector. And then they also provide some wire clips so you can hide them on. Uh, so it's actually the, the optical combiner and the projector both are actually adhered to my windshield right now. Uh, and there is actually an angle um, that you have to achieve the projector between the combiner. Uh, but it comes with a nice little template when you buy it that you just put the template on your windshield. You stick the, you stick the first thing on and then you take the template and you flip on the side, and then you just kind of pull the cardboard down, and then that's where you put the optical combiner. So, um, I, as a software guy, I went by trust but verify. So I got a couple friends to, uh, to hold things for me while I had everything on and running, and we kind of moved it around. And uh, it's like, oh yeah, the cardboard template was exactly right. So it actually took about, uh, I think we spent about 15, 20 minutes uh, kind of playing around with it before we finally stuck the tape on. Yes, and what license is the source of If I recall correctly, I think I put it under GPL3. The, the question is, what is the license of the source code? And I made it a free open source. Uh, I think I chose GPL3 for my, for my license. Yes? Could you discuss the feature that you would one button cycle? Yeah, the, the, the question was, um, instead of the keypad, could I just use a single button to cycle through the views? And uh, initially, that's what I was going to do. I was thinking about um, using uh, what's called the GPIO pins. If you take a look at the Raspberry Pi, there are these little pins right here, and you can use them to hook up buttons and things like that. Uh, but once again, that's that was kind of getting away from the simplicity, because then that requires soldering, finding a button, putting everything together, putting it in your cockpit somewhere. Um, I didn't necessarily want to deal with that for a proof of concept, and I thought uh, initially in my flatter bombing code that I might need a way to input the, uh, the wind direction and magnitude, um, so I went with the keypad that way. But you could easily do it. Um, it, it would probably save you a few dollars. Yeah, yeah so the question was, 3D printing case with Tel proper glass version, um, is the 3D print file on GitHub? And yes, it is. It's, uh, if you go to the GitHub page, there's a folder called Media, and the 3D print file is there. Um, but honestly, uh, I, I think it's worth the extra $80 to buy the, the Huddley projector. Yes? For those of us that might be a little less tech savvy, do you think it would work with to use the Huddley? Yeah, so, uh, so the question is, uh, for people who are less tech savvy, if you could just plug in your iPhone. And actually, that is the way that Hudley is designed, is that it actually comes 
uh, version that I bought has a 12 volt cigarette adapter for, for the power. That's how I'm powering it. And it will like, HDMI to uh, iPhone to HDMI converter. So it's actually intended that you plug your phone into it and then use Waze or Google Maps or whatever as your as your display. So you could turn on synthetic vision for for flight. Uh, personally, I feel that that would be way too busy for me. Um, uh, once again, moving to that whole idea of whether or not I want to charts or something like that. Um, I thought about it, I kind of played around with some things a little, and it was just too optically busy and getting away from it. If I if I want to navigate, I still have four flight. Um, I still have a paper chart, um, but that was kind of that was kind of away from my goal, and I, I think it would just be too busy to clear things out. Uh, if you go over to the Epic Optics booth, they have synthetic vision running on theirs, and you'll see that it just blocks out your field of view. So, if you want to see synthetic vision during your whole flight, that that is definitely an option. But I, I think it would be too much for me. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, the question is whether or not the newer Hudley is a higher resolution, and it is. Um, it has twice the pixels, but the problem is the Hudley wireless um, uses a piece of teleprompter glass to, to reflect the image off of an LCD screen that's sitting flat up, so you're going to get back to the problem of where is that image appearing, and it's going to appear fairly close to front That's two Raspberry Pi storm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. So uh, the, the question is whether or not uh, the code could live on the strategy box. And it very well uh, could and should. Um, that would save me one amp at five volts. So right now I, I have the software running on a separate machine, so it's easy to, to debug, diagnose, play with, swap out the SD card. I didn't have to worry about whether or not I had a, a bug in my code during rip-on, um, if it would take out my ADSB receiver or not. So uh, for the moment, uh, just, uh, moving into the so living on my ADSB receiver is one of the very big next goals that I have, um, but I didn't want to play with it for this trip yet. Yes, uh, so if, uh, the, the question is if you need help, um, where can you contact? And uh, there are a few posts on the uh, Reddit, uh, the subreddit for Stratix. So if you go to, to the subreddit for Stratix, there have been a few posts about it. Um, right now I think uh, the last one about it was maybe three or four from the top. So you can find me that way too. Um, I think my handle on Reddit was 701 pilot guy or something similar to that. So. They had 701 in the back of that. Cool. Well, um, if that's it, I think we're just about out of time here. Uh, yes? Uh, the, the question is, will it run on a Pi Zero? And uh, initially, I did run, I was developing initially on a Pi Zero. With the, with the goal of if I can fit it on a 5.0, then I should be able to run it on Stratix. And I was very close to getting it performant, but the 5.0 only has a single core, which made uh, some problems with all the processing that I was doing. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, so if you have a, a 5.0 in the cockpit, you're going to hear buzzing in your radios no matter where you put it. Thank you.